Hi, welcome to the third clip of this week's lecture on structure. Some of you may know, have noticed that the, uh, the very end of the previous clip was kind of left a little bit hanging. I kind of pressed the wrong button, but um, you didn't lose anything. I was just saying goodbye. So there we go. Uh, in the previous clip was kind of designed to convey to you the really core essential ideas, but I actually ended up going into quite a lot of detail in the second and third slides of the previous clip. In this clip, we'll continue going into a little bit more detail uh, to try and understand really what makes this theoretical current we call structuralism tick. So the way that I uh, want to uh, convey this to you is really as um, in the form of a, a little bit of a cross-cultural disagreement or even cross-purposes misunderstanding between two ways of reading Durkheim, actually. Uh, two ways that I've tagged as the British and the French, respectively, uh, because I think that there's two very strong kind of tradi tr differences of tradition between uh, French anthropology and British anthropology that are expressed in the way that Durkheim's work has been taken up in these two uh, traditions of anthropology. And I think it's in this framework that we can begin to understand really what's at the heart of Lévi-Strauss, because Lévi-Strauss I would say is really the flag bearer of the peculiarly French interpretation of Durkheim, which I happen to think is also the right interpretation of Durkheim, because uh, not least because Durkheim himself was French, so perhaps the French have an advantage uh, in that regard. But what I mean really is that um, I think that some of the ways in which the British tradition of social anthropology took up Durkheim were somewhat superficial compared to the way that the French did. Uh, and that's reflected in the way in which the word structure uh, plays a role in the work of people like Radcliffe Brown or Maya Fortes or Evans Pritchard, uh, referring to the surface kind of structural nuts and bolts of the mechanics of society, as opposed to this deep code-like code structures that are of interest to Lévi-Strauss, which I think can be uh, traced straight back to what Durkheim was saying about social facts. Now, cast your mind back to the lecture that we had on Durkheim and what he was saying about social facts and how the British with Malinowski, Radcliffe Brown, Brown and so on took those ideas up. If you remember, social facts for the Brits become social structures and social structures are really just formations or configurations of the individuals that they bring together. So matrilineal and patrilineal descent groups, for example, for structural functionalist analyses are the, the kind of ways in which members of a particular corporate group organize themselves either according to their mother's line or the father's line, matrilineal, patrilineal, right? So basically what you have in the British uh, social anthropological tradition is really a question about how individuals come together to form particular social formations and the various ways in which this can be done uh, and really social facts are emergent, uh, kind of come out of the different ways in which individuals might be related to each other. So logically speaking, what you have with British structural functionalism coming out of the reading of Durkheim is uh, empirically observable social structures that emerge out of individuals who are the starting point. Individuals are just there, you can see them. Uh, they're the starting point of your analysis and how they relate to each other is the next question you ask about them and you make uh, structural uh, um, kind of diagrams and so on about that uh, as an anthropologist. Now, that's the British interpretation. The French interpretation, which uh, starts with Marcel Mauss, Durkheim's nephew and collaborator, who then taught Lévi-Strauss and continues with Lévi-Strauss, who then is continued further with post-structuralism, as I was talking about in the previous uh, clip, right? This is in exactly turned on its head, actually. Relationships come first. It's relationships that generate the positions and the possibilities that individuals may then come to occupy, depending on how they are socialized. Remember, social facts have a sui generis power uh, and exert that power upon the particular individuals that are subject to those social facts, right? So social relationships and social structures, being examples of what Durkheim would call social facts, 
are not something that emerges out of how individuals relate to each other. Rather, they are the moulds, if you like, that format in individuals into particular kinds of beings. What I am as an individual is dictated, not, perhaps not dictated, but is conditioned by the social fact that uh, format my existence in particular ways. My, my uh, existence as a son, as a father, as a partner, as a teacher, right? All of these positionalities are not things that I adopt as an individual, but are rather positionalities that create who I am. So I am created by the structures that underpin me, rather than me uh, in relating with other people like me creating structures. So it's a really kind of, uh, almost like the opposite way of reading Durkheim. And I would suggest actually the right way, because that was the whole point of Durkheim, right? So in some ways, British social anthropology really distorts Durkheim, I would say. Now, I mentioned Marcel Mauss. It's very kind of significant to uh, note that it is in the interpretation of Marcel Mauss's great, great essay on the gift that this distinction becomes most uh, apparent. Um, I don't actually want to go into the details because it would take too long and I've tortured you enough with my clips. Uh, but there are two ways of reading Morse. Uh, one is as looking at gift exchange uh, as a kind of contract that uh, otherwise independent individuals come into and kind of render each other dependent upon each other. So the gift becomes the original social contract, if you like, uh, that prevents the kind of what Thomas Hobbes, the great English philosopher, would call the kind of state of this nasty, brutish and short lives that individuals as um, if, um, not subject to social uh, rules uh, are prone to, so that people come together uh, under the social contract, uh, give up some of that freedom in order to be able to live lives that are livable. Uh, that kind of problem is read on to Marcel Mauss's account of the gift. That's the English way of reading the gift. The French way of reading the gift, which is Levi-Strauss's way of reading the gift, in this great little book called Introduction to Marcel Mauss by Levi-Strauss, is as a story about how the form of gift exchange formats people as interdependent beings, right? So the relation of gift giver and gift receiver and the obligation to return that gift that was the problem of Marcel Mauss's essay on the gift is really an essay on the dynamics of a particular social formation that formats individuals in particular positions vis-a-vis -vis each other. So individuals are defined in relation to each other rather than entering into relations with each other, if you like, right? So the gift um, configuration, the gift relationship configures people as particular kinds of being uh, rather than um, aligning uh, otherwise independent ind individual and co-opting them into certain forms of obligation and so on, right? So the relation of the gift creates the individuals rather than the individuals entering into the relation of the gift. And that's the French reading. Now, Levi-Strauss, and here are two pictures of him with uh, bits of nature, particularly birds on his shoulder. Um, he wrote so much about humans' relationship with nature that I thought, uh, I think photographers and I too have found it appropriate over the years to show him uh, uh, with nature. I think in the first picture, he's in his fieldwork in Brazil. Um, so Levi-Strauss, uh, basically his whole structuralism can be seen as a big, big uh, attempt to really theorize uh, and draw out the implications of that fundamental Durkheimian insight about the priority of relations over individuals or over the terms indeed that they relate, right? In that little book that I mentioned, he actually criticizes uh, Morse for being too parochial in his an analysis of the gift, uh, where he goes into the details of, for example, Maori uh, explanations of, um, of uh, how the gift dynamics are meant to operate. And he's saying, no, 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 what we have in the gift is really just an example of a universal characteristic, characteristic of human existence, human society and culture as such. The idea that relations 
generate the terms that they relate, right? And that to study cultural and social phenomena is to study the configuration and the patterns of those relations and their capacity to generate particular effects, uh, including to generate particular kinds of people, as we saw, right? So this core relational idea is scaled up by Levi-Strauss to all human phenomena, not just gift exchange. Uh, he, he adopts from the 19th century uh, anthropologist that I mentioned um, a few weeks ago, people like Bastian or Tyler, the idea of the psychic unity of mankind. All human beings have the same psychic capacities. And he says there's something about the way that our mind works, how the human mind works, that makes us all, whether we're Maori, as in the case of um, the um, uh, Marcel Moses study of, of, of the gift and the famous kind of account of it in relation to Maori ethnography, whether we're French or indeed whether we're anthropologists, our mind works in the same way. We understand individual entities, including people that we, uh, that we uh, interact with, in terms of the relations in which they're embedded. And it's those relations that are the proper um, subject study of, um, uh, object of study, sorry, of uh, anthropology, right? So those relations are ultimately relations uh, uh, are of meaning, right? And meanings can only be communicated and understood, remember what we said about structural linguistics, with reference to an underlying code-like matrix of possibilities. So to give you a very simple example, I can only tell you that my jumper this week is, should I call this red? I'm not quite sure what to call it, burgundy. I don't know what you English people call this. I'm, I'm from a different country. Sometimes I get confused. Anyway, I'll call it red, right? Now that is only meaningful to you because the word red exists uh, as part of a series of other terms that also refer to colors such as blue, yellow, brown, black, white, and so on. And it's the structured system of differences and relationships between these possibilities of different color terms that gives meaning to that particular one that I pick out when I say that my jumper is kind of red. Let's call it kind of red, right? Or that the plants behind me are different shades of green, right? That's a, an opposition that I'm meaningfully conveying to you by deploying the underlying code-like matrix of possibility that the color code provides. Now, all of society and culture basically is analogous to that activity. It always involves deploying particular possibilities of an underlying code. So Levi-Strauss's structuralism can be conveyed with reference to uh, three um, uh, major influences that his thought was subject to when he was coming up with these ideas in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on. One major inspiration was actually the field of cybernetics, which was intimately bound up with the birth of the computer. And basically the attempt to manipulate or translate information that was given uh, analogically, analog signals, in terms of digital distinctions and the different kinds of manipulations that um, cybernetic procedures could perform on these digital distinctions. So this very early idea that the human mind operates a little bit like people imagined a computer might operate at that time, which is as a series of binary oppositions. That's a very important distinction for Levi-Strauss. Now, the example that I often use in a lecture, but I'm going to struggle in this clip to achieve this. Well, actually, I won't struggle. Uh, is usually in a lecture, I take a pen and I throw it up in the air to explain this. And I ask the students to describe to me the motion of that pen. And after the usual embarrassment, when people see the pen in its motion like this, people will say, you know, after the usual silence, because when you ask a question in a lecture, no one wants to answer you, people will kind of, someone will put their hand up and say, well, you threw the pen up. And I say, boom, there you go. You just used the distinction between up and down. And you use this discontinuous distinction, this binary opposition, either it's up or it's down. Think of machine code for computers, either it's one or it's zero, either it's on or it's off, to describe what is otherwise a continuous movement, up and down in this continuous way. You've kind of taken the two extremes and described it in those terms. You've taken an analog signal 
and turned it into a digital one. And Levi-Strauss thought that that's how the human brain operates. It has a whole series of binary oppositions, light, dark, male, female, moon, sun, dark, uh, you know, hot, cold, uh, high, low, you know, close, distant, all of those things. And it's those binary oppositions that are the building blocks. And of course, note that all of these are relations. None of them are simply individuals. Up doesn't make sense without referring to down, right? So all of these little relational um, blocks make up, uh, the, um, can build up and interfere and kind of coalesce and relate to each other, relations between relations to form larger um, kind of more complex forms of code, which society and culture then deploys in particular uh, ways, right? So that's the kind of inspiration from cybernetics and particularly this idea of the binary opposition, right? A second inspiration, as we saw already, is structural linguistics, right? Um, so um, basically, um, um, the understanding of structural linguistic of how language works and the distinction between long and parole, the deep underlying code and the surface use of that code in speech becomes a kind of big uh, inspiration for Levi-Strauss to extend that thought and develop it into a theory of society and culture. And the third inspiration in, uh, uh, for Levi-Strauss is actually psychoanalysis and particularly Freudian psychoanalysis. And this idea that actually these structures that structuralism is devoted to investigating and unearthing are unconscious to people, right? Just as like um, the deep traumas of my childhood might influence the way that I behave today, but I'm not necessarily conscious of them. I may not even have a memory of them. So the underlying codes um, that, um, of binary oppositions and the structures that they form, that structuralism studies, are also unconscious. So there's a depth, dive into the depth, uh, that is not completely dissimilar to the kind of psychoanalytic dive into the contents of, I, of our psyche that Levi-Strauss is inspired for. And this idea that something deep explains something surface and perhaps seemingly trivial um, such as a, you know, a particular form of behavior that I might have is explained by something rather deep that may have happened to me in my childhood. This is an idea that excites Levi-Strauss.